Google just opened the notebook LM to the public and for scientists, it might make the Gemini Pro a lot more useful. Here on the left, we have the landing page. Notebook LM gives you a personalized AI grounded in the information you trust. So this is Gemini Pro that you can give your own information in the form of PDFs or text and then it will be able to interact with that data. Currently, it's only available in the US, but I'm using VPN from Europe and it works just fine. So there is a little bit of information on how this works, but I'm gonna test it uh, in my own hands. This last part is really important. Your personal data is not used to train Notebook LM. So any private or sensitive information that you have in your sources will stay private unless you choose to share your sources with collaborators. So here we have the Notebook LM. You can make your new notebook, and here are some example notebooks. I clicked through them. I did not find them as useful, but let's try with our own notebook. So I'll make a no new notebook uh, called Hallison. Here I'm in my notebook page. Here I can add sources, so I can add PDFs, copy text, uh, Google Docs. You can add videos or uh, audio this time. Let's add a source. So we click on Add Source and PDF. So here on the left, I have the Notebook LM with my Hallison notebook, and I added 13 scientific papers. I added the original Hallison paper that was published in Cell in 2020, uh, then a follow-up paper from uh, one of the postdocs from the lab, and then some other reviews and some other papers that I found to be relevant to the Hallison topic. So on the left, we have the Notebook LM. On the right, we have uh, the BART with Gemini Pro. So Notebook LM, based on the blog post by Google, is also running Gemini Pro. So we have essentially Gemini Pro versus Gemini Pro. But on the left, the Notebook LM also has these extra sources of material. So let's ask some questions about uh, Hallison and see if the extra sources give us uh, additional boost on what we can do with this information. So let's start with something really simple, like what is Hallison? So uh, the Notebook LM tells me Hallison is a nitrothiazol compound that was originally discovered as a potential treatment for diabetes. It was found to have potent bactericidal uh, activity against E. coli, and further investigation revealed there was a broad spectrum antibiotic that is effective against a wide range of pathogens. All right, so let's see what Bart gave us. Uh, this is more of a, I think, Wikipedia style answer. It's an experimental drug, also gave me the number. It was, uh, it acts as an enzyme inhibitor for, for June kinase. It was originally developed as a treatment for diabetes. In 2020, researchers in MIT found that it was antibiotic. So uh, as far as general knowledge, I find the answer from BART to be better. The one from um, Notebook LM is a little bit too sterile, too scientific. This one is definitely a lot better overview answer. Um, but as far as uh, using Notebook LM, I don't think we'll be using it for uh, like general knowledge. We'll be using it for more uh, advanced topics. So let's uh, go deep into the mechanism of how Hallison works and see if uh, BART without the additional uh, PDF sources breaks down. How does Hallison kill bacteria and not human cells? So I'll ask the Notebook LM and let's also ask BART. So Hallison is a broad spectrum antibiotic, okay. It dissipates the bacterial transmembrane potential. Since DPH potential is essential for bacterial cell growth, Hallison kills bacteria without harming human cells, okay? And then for BARD, it gives me a lot longer answer. So uh, Notebook LM seems to be a lot more concise. So I think the answer is correct. Uh, in BARD's case, it's very long. Hallison's potential effectiveness against bacteria stems from its ability to target a specific enzyme in bacteria called June kinase. This enzyme plays a crucial role in the bacteria's stress response and ability to fight off antibiotics. By inhibiting June kinase, Hallison disrupts the bacteria's defense mechanisms, making them vulnerable and ultimately leading to their death. I don't think this is correct. I don't think it has to do anything with the June kinase activity. Uh, so it has two targets. It targets the June kinase, that's real, but that's not how it works with uh, bacteria. However, to key to Hallison's potential lies in its activity, human cells also have June kinase, but it plays a different role in our uh, physiology. Studies suggest that hallucin may not readily target human gene kinase, potentially minimizing its impact on the cells. Let's ask Bart for the references so we can hit this Google thing, and it's searching Google. It's evaluating Bart's statements, so it's kind of uh, fact-checking these things. Check complete, understand the results, so green. Google search found content that's likely similar to the statement, okay? A link is provided, but not necessarily what BART used to generate its response. Here on the bottom is the link. Hallison is a C. June N-terminal protein kinase inhibitor, which disrupts the electrochemical gradient of bacteria necessary for growth. Uh, so I think it is uh, a June kinase inhibitor, and it disrupts um, 
the bacterial growth, but that's not how it works. That's not the mechanism. This is some type of a paper that's not particularly relevant to this topic. Physical and functional characterization of nanoparticles containing antimicrobial peptide. So let's ask the notebook LM to elaborate on this statement. Is the effect on bacterial transmembrane DPH potential related to the kinase inhibitor activity? Let's ask Notebook LM and let's ask Bard. Here's the answer from the Notebook LM. Halcyon is a broad spectrum uh, antibiotic that selectively dissipates the bacterial transmembrane DPH potential. Okay, so it's just keep repeating the same sta uh, statement. Halcyon does not appear to be related to kinase inhibitor activity. Well, it, that's what was, it was found to be a kinase inhibitor at, at the beginning. These answers are a little bit hard to read. Um, Definitely, BART is a lot more conversational. While the exact mechanism of action for Hallison's bacterial effect is still under investigation, the current evidence suggests that the effect of bacterial transmembrane DPH potential is likely not directly related to its kinase inhibitor activity. So that is correct, but that is different from what it said before. So before it said, Hallison's potential effectiveness against bacteria stems from its ability to target specific uh, uh, kinase. So it has nothing to do with the membrane potential. So now when I kind of gave it a leading prompt, it corrected its answer, but you can see how you can definitely get stuck and you can um, do improper research with BART. Uh, with a notebook LM, uh, so far, I won't say it's super useful. The answers are kind of hard to read. Let's change gears a little bit. What would be the effective dose of halicin for humans? So they probably did some dosing in uh, rodents. I don't know if they did uh, human testing yet but let's see if uh, there's anything in the references. Your sources do not contain enough information to answer the question specifically. The sources do not mention an effective dose of halicin would be for humans. That's actually a really good answer. So if it doesn't have the data, it should not just uh, hallucinate the answer. Uh, for BART, determining effective uh, dose of halicin for humans is extremely premature at this stage. Okay, kind of gives me basic uh, um, guidelines on how to establish a dose, okay? It did not give me an answer for humans, so let's try with rodents. What would be an effective dose for mice or other rodents? Notebook LM. The sources do not contain enough information to answer the question specifically. The sources do mention that halicin was tested in a mouse model of infection and that the mice were treated with 4% halicin over 24 hours. However, the sources do not mention what the effective dose of halicin would be for mice or other rodents. All right, what do you mean by 4%? And for BART, determining an effective dose of halcyon for mice and other rodents is also still too early in the research process. While preclinical testing often involves animal models, the specific dosage for halcyon is an ongoing area of investigation. Okay, and then it gives you kind of basic guidelines. Therefore, there is no information. Okay. What's interesting about this answer, it says the mice were treated with 4% halcyon. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to say 4% halicin. It's usually like uh, 50 milligrams per kilogram of body mass. So let's just focus on the notebook LM because I think it's more interesting for this video. Bart gives us pretty good um, uh, general answers, but uh, I want to follow up on the answers that the notebook LM gives me. Uh, what do you mean by 4% halicin? What was the concentration? The source does mention that the mice were treated with 4% halicin over 24 hours. Since the concentration of halicin was not provided, it's not possible to determine the effective dose of halicin and of mice and other rodents. So let's click on the citation. It highlights this text. We asked whether this compound might have utility as an antibody in vivo. We therefore tested the efficacy of halicin in a murine wound model of a Baunami infection. Uh, they might have used like 4% halicin uh, solution as a topical treatment and not an in vivo treatment, uh, like uh, you would take tablets for penicillin. So that would make a little bit more sense. So from the response that I got so far, I don't think it's worth for me to test it any further. And I think I can see what the problem is. So let's look at how it uh, handles the source material. And from there, I think we're pretty clear what's going on. Here on the right, I have the original cell paper. Uh, so this is the PDF of the cell paper that was published on Halicin in 2020. And you can see on the front page, we have a nice graphical abstract. And this PDF is 39 pages long. Then we have the standard uh, title page. Um, kind of figure one overview of what they did. And you can see there's uh, lots of really nice figures and a fair bit of text. And uh, then it has references and then bunch of uh, supplemental figures. So here's the problem with the notebook LM and I don't think it's ready for prime time, especially not for uh, use as a scientific tool. So here's the Hallison paper. You can see Hallison paper here, PDF, Hallison paper, PDF. And this is how the notebook LM 
use the information from the beautiful PDF. So here we have an article. It uh, has the affiliations of the people. And here we have a graphical abstract. So it says graphical abstract and underneath of it, there's nothing. So it completely ignores the pictures that we can see right here. Has the highlights. So here, a deep learning model is trained to predict antibiotics based on structure, okay? So it's extracting the text really well, but on the first page, it completely ignored the figure. So let's go through. Uh, so here we have an abstract, okay? So it got all the authors, that's good. The summary, no problem. It uh, handles the two column text, no, uh, no problem. So here, due to the rapid emergence of antibiotic resistant bacteria, that's right here. Uh, so it, it extracts this uh, text correctly. Uh, I saw some um, posts on Twitter where it reads from here and it goes into this uh, next uh, column. So that's pretty bad. And here you can see how it's completely useless with scientific literature that uh, uses figures in the current stage. Uh, here we have a text that says chemical landscape, 108 directed message, large scale predictions, passing neural network, upper limit 108 plus. So what this is, is this figure right here. So the chemical landscape is here, the text chemical landscape, that's text chemical landscape here. And then it says 108 and then directed message, large scale prediction. The 108 is actually 10 to the eighth power, very different concept. And then it have 107, that's 10 to the seven. And then this text is completely jumbled up. Uh, it's completely different meaning than the, what the uh, figure has. So in its current stage, it seems they will probably be pretty good at handling text, but in order to use it for scientific literature, it needs to be able to handle figures um, in picture form really well. Uh, I think it's coming. Uh, Gemini Pro and Gemini Ultra are, were built to be multimodal from the ground up. I'm not sure why it's not using multimodality in this case. It's just extracting text from figures, which is useless because the text is not uh, formatted in the correct way as a written text. If you have source material that's just text, that should work quite well. And I'll test that in the future video. So subscribe for that if you're interested. But as far as using for scientific literature, no bueno right now. Subscribe for more. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next video.